Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm really excited to see so many people here. Uh, one of our first, we've had, this is only our second in-person meeting, no, sorry, third in-person meeting in almost three years. So it's just really nice to have everyone back together. Uh, I just have a couple WCG announcements. I'm sorry, I should introduce myself. Uh, I'm Rachel Greenberg. I'm the president of Washington Conservation Guild. A um, couple announcements for um, our emerging professionals. I announced it last month, but I just wanted to say once again that we have um, an, made our selection for our Williston Fund recipients. A couple are, of you are here if you want to stand up. Um, we have Kelsey Marino, Emily Mercer, <laughs> Morgan Brown, um, Catherine Miramonti, and Jones Kelly. So congratulations. <laughs> We had a really impressive pool of applicants this year. Um, this is really exciting. We've also uh, opened up WCG as free for all emerging professionals, so we're really glad to have everybody getting involved this year. Um, also for emerging professionals, we do have a happy hour coming up on Friday, December 16th at 5.45 at Penn Social. Um, we, there is uh, an RSVP link that was sent to everybody, so let us know if you can, can make it. Um, three Ring is also coming up next month, our Three Ring Circus, first in three year, in person in three years. We're really excited. We have a great lineup. That's going to be the second Thursday of January uh, the 12th, so a little bit different than usual. Um, and also something new this year is uh, that we have new Sponsor, tiered sponsorship. So I really want to say thank you to some of our sponsors, uh, Dorfman, Emma Pigment, University product, uh, Products, and Smithsonian National Collections Program. They're really allowing us to continue our program. We face a few unforeseen expenses. Some of you may have seen that our website is not working quite right, um, and our team is working really, really hard to get that up, a new website up and running that will hopefully um, be live in the next couple of months. So if, if you are interested in sponsoring WCG, you can make a donation on our website. Mm -hmm. um, and you might be able to get your name up here as well, or on our website. A um, bunch of different tiers starting at only $100. Uh, so I think that is all I have. So I'm uh, going to hand it over to one of our WCG's directors, Pamela Kirscher. to have the opportunity to introduce Lisa Sasaki. Lisa Sasaki is currently the interim director of the Smithsonian American Women's History Museum. Prior to this appointment, she was the director of the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center, which brings the Asian Pacific American stories to communities through innovative museum experiences. Sasaki has worked in the museum field for more than 25 years for organizations like the Oakland Museum of California and the Japanese American National Museum. She also served as president of the Western Museums Association's Board of Directors and as a member of AEM's Facing Change Working Group, the Center for the Future of Museums Horizon Initiative Steering Committee, and the Advisory Council for the Council of Jewish American Museums. Lisa, thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's so good to see you. I'm going to say, got it, because we know we're recording. Um, and I'm also going to hit presentation mode, so there we go. Um, we're trying something so that uh, we're recording the slides here, um, and I think I will just try to make it work. Ignore that <laughs> bar on the top here. Um, so thank you so much for having me um, here. This is interesting. I don't know if that's the projector or something we're doing here. 
I'll just keep wiggling that pointer around. <laughs> Hope it stays. If it goes out, just bear with me. Think of that as um, a mind intermission for your, um, for your eyes there. Um, so uh, I was asked to speak to you today to tell you a little bit more um, about uh, our museum, the new museums, plural. Um, as you may know, uh, we had recently two new museums authorized by Congress. Um, the Smithsonian did uh, the National Museum of the American Latino and the Smithsonian um, American Women's History Museum. Um, it's been quite a journey um, that we've been on. I've also been asked um, to talk a little bit about my journey um, to get here, as well as a list of conservation-related questions that I will try to get to as well. So we have a lot to share and to go over in the next 35 minutes or so, and then plenty of time um, for a Q&A afterwards. So we'll just keep um, moving right along. But first, I should just tell you a little bit uh, of something that wasn't in my bio, um, which is I love food. Um, I am a foodie at heart. I love going and trying out um, new places. And so when I thought about sharing this journey with everybody, I just thought, no, there was no better metaphor that I could use um, than a food one. Um, so throughout here, I'm also one of those annoying people who take pictures at restaurants. Um, and very seldom do I have the chance to show them off. Um, so you will be getting to see some of those photos um, on here as well. Um, so really, one of the things to do is to talk about um, what brought me here. Um, how did I actually get to this particular um, table uh, when it comes to being um, asked to help with creating um, one of the new uh, museums? Um, so let me give you a little bit of background in addition to my bio um, that actually doesn't make it into the short blurb, uh, but that I like to talk about. Um, I am a reformed archaeologist, I like to say. I actually started off um, thinking since the fourth grade uh, that I was going to be an archaeologist. Um, and so I pursued that all the way up um, into going to field school. Um, and then I hated it. Um, I'll just be blunt and say I, I didn't like that experience. And I was really nervous, right? Because this was then in between, and, and thank goodness, for my program that was smart enough to force everybody before um, you know, sending us out into the world, forcing us to actually go to an excavation site. Um, I was in one of the most beautiful places in the world, Greece, um, doing an excavation and realized this is not what I want to do with my life. So I came back um, and I was lucky enough to have a history advisor um, who was working me through uh, this breakdown I was having in her office. Um, and she's like, is there anything about this experience um, that you enjoyed when you were in Greece? Um, and my answer to her was, I like the stuff. I like the objects that was, were coming out of the ground. Um, and she was like, oh, aha. What you really need to do is you need to work in museums. Um, and she was, uh, I was lucky enough that she hooked me up then with my first internship at the University Art Museum, um, and that led to basically a 27-year career um, working in art history and natural science museums, um, focusing specifically on mostly community-based work. Um, so what I do is take all of the uh, learning that I have, um, really around starting with collections. I thought originally I, when I went into museums I was going to be a collections man first conservator, then collections manager. <laughs> and then I got pulled over into education. Um, uh, and then I was in curatorial. I oversaw exhibitions and, and projects. Um, and then um, went into sort of administration um, and overseeing um, you know, larger museum programs. So that's kind of my trajectory. I've, I um, have jumped around and been able to do a lot of things, but at the heart of what I do is really around making museums a more welcoming place for our visitors. And, and that's really what has driven me over time. Um, and then I, I ended up here at the Smithsonian, working um, as the director for the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center. Um, and the secretary asked me um, in March of 2021 if I would serve as interim director um, for this new museum. Um, and little did I know uh, the journey that I was about to, to um, come, to, to then go on. Um, but one of the things I just wanted to ask everybody to keep in mind um, as I go through and talk about what this journey has looked like, um, is if you had the ability to start over from scratch, 
what is the one thing that you would change about your organization? Or for those of you who perhaps don't work um, specifically in an organization, um, the museums that you might work for. So just think about that for just a moment. Um, and what I will say is, is very rarely um, does any of us really have the opportunity to start a museum from scratch. And, and that's what we're doing um, with these two new museums. Um, but, like with anything, even though we are starting from scratch, uh, there are certain what I like to call table settings, things that when I arrived at that wonderful table of creating a new museum was already there. Um, and the story starts with a statue. And this is the statue there. Uh, there's also a question attached to it, which I'll get to in just a minute. But this is a statue of um, suffragettes who um, are now in the rotunda of the United States in the Capitol um, building. Um, and a good quick question for you all here is, what is the percentage of public statues and monuments that today, or last year, 2021, um, do you think are dedicated to women nationwide? This is where the educator in me comes out and you all have to answer back. <laughs> I'm not gonna let you just sit there quietly. Shout out some percentages, what do you think? Five, percent. Five. Five, one, 75, two, Sorry. 10. <laughs> Isn't that funny that 75% got a laugh? Okay. Um, I'll go, let's go with nine. Nine percent across the nation. Yeah, pretty surprising. But you know why it might be higher than what you expected? That's counting mermaids. <laughs> mermaids drove that number up about four or five percent. Um, the reason why it started with this statue that's now in the rotunda is because um, there was a group of women who, about 20 years ago, realized that this statue was relegated to the crypt. And actually, when you walk through the rotunda, there were no women recognized in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol. And so they made it um, their job, their journey, um, to make sure that that statue moved up from the crypt and into the rotunda. And they faced a whole bunch of hurdles as they did that, um, including pe being told that it was too heavy, way too much, it's too big, um, that the women were too ugly, um, that the statue itself looked like they were sitting in a bathtub because what you can't see here is um, the rest of the uncut marble below it did actually does make it look like it's emerging out of, of a solid base there. Um, so it actually took an act of Congress for that statue to be mandated to move up. And that was the impetus for this group to then continue on and become um, the National Museum of Women's History, um, whose goal has been to create a national museum um, on the National Mall for the last 20 years. Um, but what they weren't aware of and what many people are not aware of is it actually takes three acts of Congress in order for a national museum to be mandated and created as a part of the Smithsonian. So the first act is a commission bill um, that a uh, commission is created to bipartisan to study the feasibility of a particular museum. Um, that commission then has to come back with a recommendation for women's history that occurred um, actually only about six years ago um, where that commission was, was mandated. Um, the, they came together, worked for 18 months. The commission did come back um, with a unanimous recommendation to Congress to create um, the Women's History Museum and used um, statistics like what I just shared, 10%. Um, that same 10% also applies to the number of stories of women in most your average U.S. textbook as well. Um, so they really made a case for the fact that women were um, not part um, of the American story um, and needed a museum um, in order to be able to be recognized for their contributions. The second act of Congress is one that you're seeing um, right up here, uh, which is the enabling legislation. So once the commission takes place, um, they, Congress then has the ability to recommend um, for uh, the museum to be created. Part of this legislation also directs who builds that museum. 
Um, and that is when the Smithsonian was tasked um, to do that, and unfortunately not the National Museum of Women's History. Um, so they are continuing on their fabulous work that they have been doing, um, and we have been tasked to create that um, museum. The third act uh, of Congress, which is incredibly important, um, is appropriations. Um, part of the enabling legislation states that 50% of the funding needed to build this museum will be coming um, from appropriations, the other 50% through private fundraising done by the Smithsonian. Um, so that, those are the three acts. It's, it's actually quite a laborious process uh, for some, like the National Museum of the American Latino, there's, there can be a decade. Um, there was 12 years between the completion of their commission bill and the signing of this legislation. For um, women's history, it took much, much longer to get the commission bill, but a much shorter time um, to get the enabling legislation. Um, the enabling legislation laid out a couple of other directives um, within that. Um, one of them, and timelines too. Uh, and what I'd like to say is there's nothing more um, interesting, you'll see, and complicated than having um, Congress directing you to do particular things when it comes to setting up your museum. Um, and so for, for anybody who has worked at another organization that is not part of uh, the Smithsonian, just to say, that's something to be happy about, uh, because <laughs> if we didn't meet one of these deadlines that I'll be mentioning, um, we are actually in violation of the law. Um, so our bylaws were uh, for um, our new advisory council, if you see up here, um, the fact that we had to seat this advisory council in six months um, was all written into law. Um, so we um, had a very rapid timeline in which we needed to be able to um, bring these amazing women and men um, on board that you can see here um, during the site visits that they did um, earlier in May. Um, it, was, it is an amazing group of women. You can see them all up here. Um, I'd like to say I never thought I would be able to um, say that I was on, um, I was part of a museum that on their advisory council, we have Wonder Woman. <laughs> um, we have uh, amazing women like Alice Walton, um, Billie Jean King, um, Craig Newmark, uh, the founder of Craigslist. Um, Tori Birch, these are just some of the, the very notable men and women who um, jumped in um, and agreed to come on board. Uh, this is just another quick note for any of you who've had to seat a board before or been on a board yourself, um, which I highly encourage um, you do uh, sometime within your career. You'll know that oftentimes um, when asked to join, the first question you should probably ask is who else is on um, the board, who else will be on the board with me, and who will be leading the board. Um, in this particular case, um, we had such, such a short timeline, um, we actually couldn't tell any one of these people on here who else was serving. We actually needed them to commit first. Um, so all of these um, fabulous people took a jump um, into, uh, into this position without knowing who else was serving with them which is really amazing. The other thing that um, the legislation laid out was uh, the mandate that the Smithsonian regents identify a location on or near the National Mall um, for the two new museums. Um, and they gave us two years to do it. Now, two years seems like a lot of time, right? Um, because certainly there's lots of places to be able to build a new museum, right? <laughs> no, unfortunately there is not. Um, the mall itself um, is protected uh, through various acts um, that designate to, uh, to preserve the green spaces. We also have a lot of agencies um, whose headquarters have been here for hundreds of years. Um, as well as um, existing museums already in place. Uh, so the Smithsonian um, was also required as a part of this to um, consider these things when building um, the, or selecting the site for the museums, um, which includes consultations with various commissions. Um, like I said, we had to do it within two years. It had to be on or near the National Mall. We needed to consider cost size, location, um, and uh, a prox a proximity proximity to transportation, environmental concerns, um, 
all of those needed to be uh, considered. Um, once we did identify a space, the, the agency, the head of that agency or entity needed to be willing to give over um, that land. They, they must agree to, to the transfer um, and some other things here in particular um, on this site, um, for these sites. So here's a list, sorry that the top two kind of got cut off, but no worries there. It's primarily just listing out that we looked actually at 27 different sites uh, when it came um, to, uh, to what we were looking at. Uh, when I've given this presentation before, people have been like, oh my god, um, uh, you know, my husband works at the Department of Labor and they've never heard that you were looking at their building <laughs> for the site of the new museum. <laughs> Um, and I would say, uh, and that's because it never got very far. <laughs> um, we would have conversations with various agencies. Um, basically, we're just doing due diligence. So if somebody happened to suggest um, that, say, the newly renovated or under renovation um, building for the National Museum of Women in the Arts seemed like a good location, um, we, put, we had to put it on the list for consideration, and then we very quickly crossed it off. Um, because uh, it wasn't going to be something that um, we were going to be able to pursue. So the, the sites themselves kind of fell out into two different tiers. You're seeing the entire list here, um, but it was very clear that there was really only um, about 10 sites um, that we could truly consider um, that fit the designation of on or near the national model. Um, again, just some considerations when looking at um, these locations, which included um, uh, lots of things that I never thought I would need to know about, mm -hmm. to be honest. Um, uh, floodplains. Does anybody know where the 100-year the floodplain happens to be in Washington, D.C.? Any guesses? If you say the National Mall, you would be correct. <laughs> Um, in particular, the north side of the National Mall. So the next time you're out there, you might realize that there is a slight elevation change to the south, where the buildings on the south side of the mall are actually on higher ground, enough higher ground that the flooding risk uh, diminishes. Um, and then when you go towards um, Constitution Avenue, that's actually where the historic floodplain is. Um, and one of the reasons why those museums on that side of Constitution are um, in considerable danger of flooding, especially on the lower levels. Um, uh, tunnels. Uh, there are a lot of tunnels going around um, DC. Uh, 12th Street Tunnel, 9th Street Tunnel, various extensions of the 395. Um, there are even rivers <laughs> that are flowing underneath the ground. Um, so all of that needed to be taken into consideration. Um, we also knew that things like bus drop-offs, right, um, become really critical when you're having people move around. Um, we also needed to make sure that um, the cost wasn't going to be exorbitant. Um, in many of these cases of some of those buildings that we mentioned, we would have to tear them down, um, and that would cause a considerable expense because um, GSA would have to move those agencies and relocate them to a new building first before those buildings could then be demolished or renovated, um, which would add on considerable cost um, to the project in additional time. Another question. See, you didn't know I was going to be asking all this, right? <laughs> Another question. If you had to guess, moving an agency out of its current existing building, <laughs> approximately how much do you think that would cost? A hundred million dollars. We sound like an evil villain <laughs> in Austin Powers. Um, a billion, for the person who said a billion dollars. Up to 1.5 billion to move and replace uh, one of the, um, 1.5 would be one of the larger buildings like the Department of Energy. Some of the smaller buildings um, would be under a billion, um, and that would mean, though, that we would be having being on a smaller plot of land. So just some, some fun facts. Before I get there, I'm just going to jump up back over here and say, for those of you who have read the newspapers recently, you probably have seen um, that the Board of Regents has selected to um, uh, what they would like to say as um, optimal sites for the two new museums. They have not specified which of the new um, the museums would go where. 
uh, but I'll just point them out. One is number nine here. Um, this is what we're calling the South Monuments uh, site. It is directly across from the National Museum of African American History and Culture on the south side of the mall. Uh, the other site is right here. It's, uh, if you could read that, it says Rugby Field. Um, <laughs> these are the rugby fields here on your way to Tidal Basin. It's directly across the street there from, um, this is the U.S. Holocaust Museum. Um, so those are the two. Um, you're probably wondering why there isn't a number and a shaded in space here. That's because this was added late um, into consideration um, and didn't make this particular slide. Um, the things that you will probably not know about these two sites, though, is they are part of the, the reserve. Um, what the reserve is, is um, congressionally protected green areas on the National Mall where it will take an act of Congress to release those um, and allow us to be able to build. Uh, fun fact, uh, <laughs> National Museum of African American History and Culture was also part of the National Reserve but was given dispensation to build. Um, and currently, right now, we are waiting to hear back from Congress, um, hopefully in the upcoming omnibus bill that will give funding to the full federal government for FY23. Uh, we are hoping that they will provide clarification to the legislation um, and allow us to, to build in those spaces as well. But we will see. Okay. Um, speaking of building, we do know, though, um, how to build pretty good museums. Um, this is one example, uh, and we're very lucky to, of course, have um, the founding director of NAMAC um, be the current secretary um, and leading us through as we um, come to this moment where we are creating two at the same time. So we do have a fairly good idea about how long it's going to take um, and what phases we need to go through. Um, so here are the different phases. Again, the slide's a little old, but um, the we are finishing with site selection right now. Um, we then have about three years for uh, planning and programming. Basically, that means all of those studies that we need to do, audience research, um, uh, looking into collections to see what collections are available, um, uh, doing environmental studies, uh, figuring out how big the restaurant needs to be, um, how big the conservation lab should be. Um, those are all things that happen in the planning and programming stage. Programming in this case means the program of the overall museum building. Um, after that, we take all of that information, we go out and do uh, an RFQ um, for an architect. Um, and then we need to give that architect and the engineers who are going to be designing the building um, at least three years um, in order for us to do that, do all the permitting, get through all of the um, permissions and reviews that are needed from the various commissions, including commissions like the Commission of Fine Arts and the National Planning Capital Planning Commission, all of which, again, laid out in the legislation telling us we must do that. Um, and then about six years um, to be able to construct it from there. Uh, and while all of that's happening, of course, we are looking at um, collection storage, which will uh, most likely be off-site, actually 100% likely will be off-site, <laughs> mainly because um, we recognize that the spaces on the mall are at a premium, and all of the square footage there um, should be directed towards um, public-facing spaces. Uh, however, we are aware that there are going to, to be back-of-house needs, um, especially around installation of, of objects into exhibitions. Uh, so we are going to be looking to see how much we need. Um, and oh, by the way, it's also, remember that pesky floodplain? It's also probably a better idea that we have off-site storage for that reason as well. Um, if you're good at math, which I'm assuming all of you are, um, you will probably add all those numbers up and realize that we are a good 10 to 12 years um, away from opening to the public as a result of this. Um, what I have let people know um, when they ask us, can't you do this any faster? Um, don't women deserve to be recognized? My answer is yes, we deserve to be recognized. However, we also deserve a building that does not fall down. Um, <laughs> And uh, as the secretary likes to remind all of us, we are building a building that shall hopefully be around as long as there is an America. Um, so that's not a process you really want to rush and, and then regret. Um, so we are um, going to be um, thorough, as the Smithsonian is, when it does these projects um, and make sure that when we do open um, that all these things have been considered and we don't want to rush through that um, artificially. 
speaking of conservation, I got a list of conservation related <laughs> specific questions that you were hoping that I would answer. I think all of the general questions I've hit um, through uh, my talk here today, or I will hit by the time we get to my last slide. Um, so I just wanted to go through some of these. Um, and this is where my answers start to get a little evasive. Uh, because unfortunately, without a site, we don't know how big of a building we're going to have. Without knowing how big of a building we have, um, we don't know, uh, for example, uh, if we are going to have the substantial amount of space and specialized facilities for a conservation lab, unfortunately. Um, but I can answer positively in some ways um, on these. Will conservation be involved in the planning of new exhibition galleries and configurations for object display? That is one of the things that we are trying very hard in our quest to do things differently, right? What are those things that we can change that we know we should do differently so we don't create problems down the road that we wish we changed later, we wish we could change later on? Involving and making sure that um, collections and conservation is involved earlier in the process rather than having to deal with things later on is really important. Um, we don't want to have to go back and try to fit a conservation lab into a converted broom closet because we weren't talking to the right people. Um, so that's something, again, part of that process of slowing down and making sure that as many people can be involved in this as possible. Um, what else is on here? Um, our, so how does this affect the facility requirements? That's part of that three-year process. We want to try to get as many of these um, uh, sort of requirements into that engineering um, and architectural planning. Um, we would love to be able to have a scientific lab and conservation scientists on staff would love, 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 love to do that. Um, right now, we are looking at a staff of about 150 is our, an, our anticipated um, uh, staff size. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of needs going into those 150 um, uh, uh, staff spaces, staff positions. Um, so definitely on my wish list uh, for, uh, for the new museums. Um, does the museum plan to balance, how does the museum plan to balance maintaining environmental controls um, and sustainable practices. So, um, one of the things that the council, our advisory council, has sort of stated to us is two things that they consider to be table stakes. So in other words, things that we go in not even questioning that we are going to do. Um, one of which is inclusion and diversity. This is about um, all women's stories. Uh, and as a result of that, we need to be as inclusive and expansive as possible in our definitions. Um, and in the stories that we feature. The other table stakes is around um, sustainable practices. So although this is going to be a federal building, um, and as a result there are certain parameters around building that we, um, they are required, we are required to meet, and certain levels of sustainability around the building, um, we are hoping to definitely exceed that and are already talking about what is beyond LEED um, certification and can we do, can we aspire, even if we don't 100% make it there, can we at least aspire to a zero um, carbon footprint um, when we build the, these museums um, and in the practices that we do. So 100% um, we are working on that um, and what we're hoping is within all of that we can work um, on the latest technologies to help us um, to do things like manage lighting, light temperature, humidity, pollutants, etc. Um, will the integrated pest management program be operated internally by museum staff or externally by a contract company? Absolutely no idea. <laughs> no idea. Um, but hopefully one day I will be able to answer that question. Um, would uh, SWAM, which is how we're saying the acronym, <laughs> consider any of the following conservation-related uh, community outreach activities? And there's a list here. 100% yes. In fact, if any one of you would like to partner with us, um, we would love to be able to do that. Um, we are working with the American Women's History Initiative. Um, that was our precursor um, pan-institutional um, uh, program here for uh, women. Um, women's history at the Smithsonian, and they um, have not only uh, a 
sort of collaborations and partnerships across multiple units here at the Smithsonian, they also have an initiatives pool of money. So um, if you're a part of the Smithsonian, if you happen to work um, for the Smithsonian and would like to apply um, for one of those, uh, those grants, um, the proposal cycle is now open. Um, so feel free to download one of those and, and, and make a proposal. Would love to have um, um, some of the programming be around conservation related. Um, activities. Is the museum leadership planning ahead for training in emergency preparedness and response? So after talking about floodplains <laughs> and water issues and water tables, I didn't talk about how low, um, to, uh, how high the water table is um, and how quickly we can break through that water table, especially if we dig um, basements. Um, here on the National Mall, the answer to that is yes. <laughs> um, we are planning ahead for that and hoping that we can mitigate what we can, what we can't, we're going to have to plan for. And I know that was the topic next door. <laughs> okay, now um, in the time that I have left, uh, what I wanted to share with you is these are all the things that we, we have been informed we are going to do um, by Congress, by museum practices, by great questions that people have asked us, um, things that I, I can answer. Uh, but one of the things that I really am intrigued by, uh, which made me say yes um, to doing this interim role, um, and what keeps me going um, through all of the craziness that is um, building a new museum, is this idea that we can actually do something different. Um, that we don't have to build the same exact museum that was built in the 1990s because believe it or not, it's 2022, almost 2023, and we know so much more um, than what we used to know. So why build a museum based off of old practices? Um, and so if we are allowed to dream just a little bit, right, and think about what we would want this museum the Smithsonian American Women's History Museum to be, what would be the one word that, would you, that you would choose, that you would want to hear visitors say uh, to describe this new museum? Shout it out. Inclusive, inclusive inspiring. inspiring. Sorry. Relevant, engaging. Relevant, engaging. What else? Challenging. challenging. We actually want them to think and be challenged when they walked in. What else? Reflective? I'm going to be one of those annoying educators who keeps saying, what else? <laughs> Enjoyable. Enjoyable. I love that. Memorable. Memorable. How about fun? Anybody want it to be fun? Yes. Revisitable. Revisitable. <laughs> yes. That should, be, um, that should be in the dictionary. Revisitable. <laughs> Um, I really do like all of those words, and I, I think that all of us um, who work in museums, who love museums, we always hope that our museum experiences, the museum experiences that we create for our, the visitors, um, are all of those things. But we also know that oftentimes we fall short about that, um, from that. And even more interestingly, um, we know why. Um, we often know what stands in our way. Um, this ha happens to be a word cloud from when um, we pulled together in the first year um, that I was interim director, we pulled together a focus group of over 100 Smithsonian employees in five different areas, which included collections, uh, digital, curatorial, administration, um, and education, um, to come together to provide insights in what we needed to do differently. If they had the opportunity, from their point of view, to do things differently for this new museum in order to ensure that not only was it all of these adjectives that you see up here, um, but that also it could help us build towards a more equitable um, world, a more equitable Smithsonian. What would that look like? Um, what we heard back and, and um, what has become sort of the foundation of the work that we are continuing on with on sort of a philosophical side are these things here that I just wanted to go over and then I'll go into some of the specifics that the focus groups um, have came, came back with. Um, the first is, uh, I've, as you know, we've been talking about 
inclusivity, diversity is one of those touch points. But more specifically, we, we go into this understanding that women's experiences are not monolithic. Um, that the, the, the temptation would be that we create a museum that looks like a hall of fame or talks about the first, the first mm -hmm. woman to do this, the first woman to do that. Um, and it's not that we don't celebrate the first, but one of the things I feel really strongly about is we also need to recognize the fifth, the 52nd, the 176th woman who walked into the same um, environment of which those first had to first break through. Um, but they were the ones who continued, persevered, and ensured um, that women were then seen um, in those areas. And that today, we no longer hear some of the things that I heard growing up, which is girls can't or women can't be whatever, fill in the blank. In my generation, it was firefighter, firefighters, jet pilots, um, doctors, um, a whole bunch of things where um, you didn't see uh, as many women. So that's really going to be important. Um, that the stories that are being told have to be inclusive and expansive. We often get questions about um, what does it mean to be a woman. Um, and this is the first Smithsonian Museum that's going to be uh, dedicated to looking at gender um, as a topic. Um, and that we, we understand that that is something that we're going to have to explore. In fact, it's not the only word that we're going to have to explore in the title that, oh, by the way, Congress gave us. Um, so there was a question of like, are you going to change your title? And I was like, would you like to suggest amending the legislation um, in order to do that? Um, but the, um, we really do need to question. We need to question what does it mean to be an American? Um, we need to question what does it mean to be a woman? Um, what does it mean to look at history at this particular time? And even what does it mean to be a museum? The only word that's not up there is Smithsonian. I think we kind of know what the Smithsonian is, so we're, we're okay there. Um, but when we take on and asking all of those questions for those other words in our title, we have to recognize that we're going to be um, wading in um, into very sensitive areas um, that really have to do with people's identity um, and how they see themselves um, and how they see their world. And so for us to do this, we're going to have to do that with bravery and compassion um, in many cases. We recognize also that we are building this museum in a time where um, we are in the digital age. And so it's not just about building a physical museum, but we also have to build our digital presence at the same time. We don't want to have one before the other, which many museums do, trying to create a digital experience out of a physical one or vice versa we're trying to actually find a different way of doing things. <coughs> um, and then finally, one of the things that we, um, as I've said, we don't need to do things like they've always done before. All those things that we said, well, you have to do it this way. My answer to that is, is why? Why do we have to do it that way? Is there a different, a better, uh, uh, more exciting way that we can do things? So speaking of what does it mean to be a different type of museum, um, the focus groups actually answered that for us, um, and these are, this is their main responses that, that came back. Um, they want museums, they want the Smithsonian Museum specifically, that can be responsive to current events, that we don't shy away from it, knowing the Smithsonian must be nonpartisan, but does that mean we shy away from talking about things that are happening out in the world around us? Um, there was a recommendation that we adopt matriarchal and women-centered structures. Ooh, isn't that exciting? Um, recognizing that the hierarchical structure um, of our, our organizational charts are incredibly patriarchal. Um, and what would it look like if we took on some of the, the values and inspiration from matriarchal cultures and societies in order to change the way we do work internally? Um, there was a desire to see us embrace caretaking um, as a, a mode, a, a way of thinking and a being um, to question uh, museum practices, some of which museum practices would say, what are you talking about caretaking? Um, and for those of you who care for, for objects, um, you know how, what it means to be a caretaker within a museum. But what if we apply that same thinking to people? in addition to objects. I'll get back to that in just a moment. Um, we need to also challenge visitors' expectations about what a museum can be. The number of times somebody has asked me if we are going to take on and display the First Lady's gowns, 
if I had a dollar for every time somebody asked me that, I would be wealthy. My answer to um, them is no. Um, they have an amazing spot in uh, the National Museum of American History. And oh, by the way, I'd like to think that we could talk about the First Ladies in a way that does not involve what they wore. Um, and uh, we can also use, we can also use um, the, our, what we are building to be able to really support women entrepreneurs and innovators, whether that's in the restaurants, the gift shops, um, design, um, any number of areas uh, where uh, we can make sure that women are represented and included. Um, sort of breaking down some of these things a little bit more, I'm going to speed through this because I do want to have, give you guys time for, to ask me questions. Um, one is really we needed to really rethink digital um, as we did this because um, so often we develop um, our digital programs without thinking about who's going to use it. It's like we will build it and they will come. And the answer is the digital space is so crowded, no, they will not come. <laughs> um, they Because they're already in places and doing what I'm going to be doing later tonight, which is spending time on YouTube and Instagram. So um, those are things we really have to think about. We have to be able to be willing to share authority um, for content cre creation beyond the Smithsonian curators and programmers. Um, and we also need to think about dreaming, right? What kind of worlds can we utilize technology to help us build differently? Um, you know, right now we use that technology to create worlds on TV. We see um, the world, what the world would look like in Hands Made Tale or Westworld. Um, what if we use a fraction of that technology to show people what it would look like if we had gender equity instead of not having gender equity? Something to think about. Um, rethinking collections. Um, this is something that um, has uh, came up from the collections group, and that was a mixture of collections managers, registrars, conservators, and curators, um, all around sort of collections. Um, and they say, said, interestingly enough, okay, I think we're going to be the group of collections people who actually say we need to be more about people than we do collect objects. Um, and that became sort of the heart of what, uh, of what their, their remarks were. They wanted us to really rethink how we did permanent collections. Do we even need a permanent collection given what else the Smithsonian has already collected over time? Um, we really needed to reutilize and revisit and rediscover those objects, those millions of objects that are there, which, by the way, is not going to be an easy task. Um, if you would have to guess what thing is not searchable, um, in a collections database. If you said gender, you would be correct. Um, unfortunately, the only way that we can search um, through our databases for something like that is to use really outdated and frankly misogynistic terms like housewife um, as the only way, because that was what was used to designate gender. Nobody thought to mark if it was uh, you know, a woman identifying maker, artist, um, user, scientist, we're going to have to go back and rediscover all of those, or discover for the first time, all of those stories attached to those objects. Um, they also encouraged us to think about shared stewardship as a model, instead of bringing it in and saying, this is the Smithsonian's. What if we said and said, this is the Smithsonian's and the community in which it was collected, maybe they take care of it um, and we just borrow it. Okay. So, as I end my talk, because I, I probably gave you quite a bit to think about here, um, I just wanted to revisit the question I started off with, um, that if you had the ability to start from scratch, now that I've given you all of these different ideas, um, what would you want this museum to remember to do um, in all of your experience and expertise? That's a rhetorical question. I'm not going to force you um, to answer back um, for that. Um, but what I will say is um, one of the things I can, I can honestly say is there's so many things that I forget, right? Because I am a product of the museum field in all of these years just as much as everybody else is or will be if you're an emerging professional. And as a result, there are blind spots that I've developed. Um, so I'm counting on all of you <laughs> um, to help remind all of us, um, the team at the Smithsonian American Women's History Museum, um, about what we need to do to build um, that better museum for all of us. Okay, that's it um, on my part.
And now I get to the fun part, which I actually enjoy the most, which is why I was sort of rushing in the end, because we have 10 minutes. I'm sorry, I keep moving. Um, and, and the video camera has to be adjusted. But I don't really like to speak behind a podium, but that's where the, the down button was. Um, so questions, questions for me. And can we turn the lights on? Is there somebody by the switch? Great, now I can see your faces. <laughs> But you are a little too far for me to call by name because the name tags are a little small. So you'll have to, if you want to introduce yourself. Wow, I've stunned you into silence. In the back. Hi, my name is Lasarsha. Uh, I'm from Boston. Um, I have a question for you. What has been the most unexpected thing that you've learned so far? Oh, there are so many unexpected things. Um, I think the thing that made the most impact on me is realizing how many systems that we have that we just blindly follow um, that are, are actually patriarchal. Like I never once stopped to think like this sort of, of we all look to one leader, we all um, work our entire careers to be at the top of that org chart. Um, and then once we're up there, we expect everybody just to do what we tell them to do. Um, not if you're a good leader, but, if, but for most of the time, I think that's how we see that. That's a very, very Western patriarchal model. Um, and one of the, the really meaningful things, um, that interactions that I had was talking to a scholar who has devoted her life um, to looking at matriarchal cultures. And um, I came to her and said, you know, we have this aspiration. We, you know, we've been requested to do things more in a matriarchal fashion. How can we do this? And um, <laughs> she paused and she's like, Lisa, um, patriarchy is so integrated into everything that we do. I'm not sure what it is to advise you on what to do here. Um, she's like, the only thing I can do, though, is, is to recommend that you look at the values that are built in behind um, these matriarchal societies and cultures, um, whether it's this idea of the collaborative, um, that it is about the group, not a single person. Um, the one that I've taken to heart um, is gratitude. Um, and the way um, it's framed oftentimes is that everything, every exchange, um, it should be seen as a gift. Um, your invitation to me to come to talk to you tonight, that was a gift you gave to me. Um, the information that I just shared with you about my journey was the gift I gave to you. Um, and as a result of that, if you thought about every interaction that you have with one another as an exchange of gifts, then gratitude for that gift um, comes into play. Um, so what I have been trying to practice and what has been the biggest aha for me is the practice of embedding gratitude into what I do. So I thank everybody. Um, it's, and I, I, I do it with, uh, with honesty <laughs> um, and with a deep appreciation for the gifts that they're giving me with the work that they're doing on this new museum. Um, and I try to keep that as a, a forefront. So that, for me, I think was a really big uh, aha moment that I, that, to be honest, I didn't have before. Um, especially when it came to, um, uh, you know, I've, I've been in museum leadership now for over 10 years, a little bit longer than that. Um, and, and that isn't something that's ever really come up. But this opportunity has given me that chance. Sorry, that was a very philosophical answer <laughs> to a very good question. And I, I, I do have other answers to that that I could probably say. Um, like the searching, I, I found it shocking that we couldn't search for women um, and we couldn't find women within collections of millions. Um, and, and that goes back to those systems, right? Um, who created the, the uh, original parameters for searches and the original things that we deem to be important to write down about our collections objects? Men. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, and then as a result of that, who got to decide what was important as a searchable term? 
um, we have a lot of work to, to, to turn that around and to change that. Other questions? So Chuck, and then um, back to... Um, so, um, yeah, thanks for your presentation. Uh, so I think one of the paradigms that sounded like you were trying to change was taking things from like a object-oriented to like a person-oriented. And I'm wondering in a, a museum environment, like how that shift would manifest itself. Yeah. Um, People sometimes interpret that to mean, especially when I say we, we won't have permanent collections, they're like, oh my god, there's not going to be any objects um, in this museum. No. Um, I am, as you can tell, like the foundation of my love for this entire field is based on that stuff, right? Um, we're not going to be doing away uh, with, with collection objects. However, what I, when you say paradigm shift, that's exactly it. What I think about it is a lens shift, right? What if we looked at an object not as, um, only as an object that must be preserved, but instead we see the people behind it who made it, and then more importantly now who cares for it. So we talked about caretaking. One of, uh, an example that came up around caretaking um, was, re was realizing that objects can actually um, uh, carry trauma. Um, an example that I'll use is the Smithsonian recently um, multiple units came together to acquire a sexual assault evidence kit. Um, just to let you know, there was a lot of discussion, why are you collecting that? Why would you tell people that we had that? Why is it even important? Um, there, so there was that level of it. There's also a level to realize that every time somebody who's, who is a collections manager, a registrar, a curator, every time they open that drawer where that kid is, um, there is a, a trauma um, that can be triggered and attached to that. So how do we do a better job at identifying sensitive collection objects so somebody doesn't open up that drawer and just get hit by that? Um, how do we recognize that we're asking a lot of the people who are caring for those objects? Um, and how do we provide support going forward for both people um, who are caring for it and then also the people viewing it in the future? Um, I asked that same group, one of the questions that I, I didn't ask them, we had a facilitator because nobody's going to be honest with me um, if I was in some of those focus groups. Um, but the facilitator, I asked the facilitator to ask um, if those groups could hire um, new positions that had never been part of, the, of any museum before. What positions would they hire? The collections group was the group that said, you know what we need? We need therapists. <laughs> um, we need therapists who work not only with um, the visitors, but also the staff. Um, and wouldn't it be great if we had art therapists um, who can go in and help people? Because again, if we're going to do this in a compassionate and brave way, we are going to be unearthing things within them. Again, really long philosophical answer to a very good <laughs> uh, question. But that's an example of switching that lens, right? From going from, this is an object, it's made out of paper, um, to going, if this is an object um, that has people and it will be impactful for people. And right there. Sure. Um, I'm just going to, it's less of a question more of a tell me more. Um, <laughs> collaborators and people that you've consulted with that we would never guess. Like, can you share another anecdote about that? I was fascinated when you mentioned the um, specialist, the anthropologist who specialized in nature and cultures. Mm -hmm. Um, some others that I've been really inspired by and really enjoyed working with, Tori Birch. Um, I don't know how many of you know her from her as a designer, a high-end designer. I don't know how many of you know um, that actually the reason why Tori Birch created her brand, her line, was because her whole goal was to make enough money to support women entrepreneurs. That, that, that was what she wanted to do. Um, and she worked backwards from that to say, what my skill set is, is I'm really good at designing. And if I create a label um, and, and get really big, I can funnel all of the, the money from that in order to help women um, be successful as, in business. Her foundation is amazing. Um, that uh, takes uh, fellows and, and helps uh, women incubate their business ideas. 
um, supports them, um, gives, helps them with business planning, um, marketing, other things to really launch um, their careers. So she has support now from Bank of America and other uh, funders. Uh, we partnered um, with a foundation at her Embrace Ambition Summit, um, where what she wanted to do was really have us talk about all these um, women icons, women who should be icons, but we actually don't know their names. Um, and that was, that was what she asked us to do. So I'm constantly inspired um, by uh, people like Tori um, and incredibly grateful that she said yes to be on our council and that allows us to be able to work with her and the foundation um, in this particular way. So that's, that's one example. I have more, but I'm sure there's other questions. Um, let's go here, then back there, and back up here. Okay. Um, in what ways will you be inclusive of training? Voices and sort of avoid that turf mindset uh, with the new museum that includes women's experiences? So, um, what I always say to this is that, um, first of all, archaeologists, anthropologists by training here, um, I am coming into the conversation with an understanding that gender is a social construct, a cultural construct. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, our definitions of gender and gender roles change um, over time, continue to change. Um, and that as a result of that, we need to be inclusive of, of the full spectrum of that. Um, that includes trans, it includes femme, and includes a lot of other designations that, to be honest, we might not have words for right now, um, but that um, we will hopefully develop words for so that people can better express um, their identity and who they are. Um, that's where we're going um, in that direction. Um, we do have uh, Martine Rothbaugh, um, who is amazing, and she's on um, our council, um, uh, creator, co-creator of Sirius XM, um, now uh, working, her company is now working to create um, uh, the first uh, pig to human organ transplants so that in the future there will be no shortage of organs for people who need transplants. Um, amazing um, and a huge inspiration. So those are some of the ways we're dealing with it. Are we, are, are we there yet? No. We have a lot of learning to do, a lot of listening um, to do, and, and um, really wanting to be able to move. I, in other words, that's the part I much prefer to be doing versus worrying about if the omnibus bill is going to pass <laughs> in October. Thanks. I think there was a question back. Um, I, guess, I guess you've kind of already shared some stories, but I was wondering if there's any particular story that we might not have ever heard of before that you really want to include in the museum? I mean, I know it's early days yet, but... Oh, there are so many. Um, I, I hesitate to answer that because it's like choosing a favorite. Um, it's like you know somebody asking what your favorite um, you know child is. But I, I will use the one that is top of mind. How about that? Because um, recently I was in Los Angeles um, for uh, at Paramount Pictures uh, for the launch of the Anime Wong Quarter. Um, and for those of you who aren't aware, uh, the U.S. Mint. Um, has launched a series of American women on quarters. Uh, it's that they've launched the first year, which is five. Um, there's four additional years up and coming, uh, which will feature additional um, uh, women. Uh, the American Women's History Initiative and the Smithsonian help um, with the selection process and are doing programming around it. So this particular program was all around Anna Mae Wong, um, who it, uh, was an Asian American um, bona fide uh, superstar. Um, in Hollywood. Uh, and what's really amazing about her story um, is the fact that uh, she got typecast. Um, she was in a film called Shanghai Express that we we screened it. If you do happen to watch it with 21st century eyes, it is an uncomfortable experience to see um, how uh, uh, you know things were just were presented at during that time period. Um, but she was amazing in it. Um, and unfortunately though, she got typecast. Um, she was always the exotic beauty, the slave girl, um, the demure um, Asian woman. Um, and so eventually, out of protest, she left um, the U.S. and was like, if you're not going to give me the roles that I want to go, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, be here anymore. So she went over to Europe um, and is actually better known in Europe for her film work um, there. Um, and then before coming back and, and having sort of a, 
a later in life, in her 40s and 50s sort of resurgence here in the United States. Um, a lesser known story that many people don't know about um, that I do from my work on the Asian Pacific American Center is that um, being an actress, especially in an Asian American family, wasn't something at the time that people were very proud of. And in fact, um, when she passed away of a, of a heart attack um, in her early 50s, her estate passed over to her father who was still alive um, and he destroyed many of the scripts, um, costumes, and things that, they, that she had because he felt so much shame um, that she was an actress. Um, her family were, was there. They're lovely, amazing people who honor her legacy now. But I think that it is a really interesting story, um, speaking of, of gender norms that get passed down. Um, and these brave women who are trying to break through it. So that's one of the, the stories I would share. I know we're over time, so we'll just go one more, and then I'll let all of you go. I know you're probably all hungry and tired after working a long day. Thank you so much for sharing this insight that we haven't had before into this process in the museum. And my question is about um, some of the salary disparities, disparities that we have in our field in conservation. We have over 70% of our field that identifies as female, yet our male colleagues make much, much more that we do than we do still. And with the opportunity to hire 150 people and a new HR department, I wanted to ask how you all are going to address that. Um, we are doing our best within the federal hiring system. So I'm, you know, we still have we have to adhere to grades. Sure. Um, uh, probably about 90 percent of our personnel budget is coming from the federal appropriations. Um, so all of this is these are going to be fed positions, um, which means we have to adhere to that. That said, <laughs> we are not um, sitting back and just um, doing nothing uh, with this. Um, one small thing that we are doing is we're ensuring that um, the overwhelming majority of our positions that we can get through are going to be career ladders. Um, so for those of you who work in the Fed system, you know that um, if you go in at a particular grade and you're not in a ladder where you can go up to the next grade, you actually hit a ceiling that you can't go beyond unless, and th then you have to reapply. Um, even if it's your same position, only just at a higher level. So what we're doing, and it's taking a little bit more time, so our, our hiring has been a little slower. Everything at the Smithsonian is slower, I should say, <laughs> um, than I'm used to, coming from outside of the Smithsonian and the federal system. Um, but in this particular case, we're taking that little extra time to ensure um, that people don't hit those ceilings. We're also trying to create career paths um, and equity when it comes to um, titles. So oftentimes um, within the federal system, you have what's on your PD, and then you have the title you give yourself <laughs> or that your, your boss gives you as, as a compensation. So sorry we can't pay you more because you're capped, uh, but we'll call you uh, the director of conservation. Well, you're the only conservator. But still, we're going to call you that. And then the problem with that, though, is first of all, you might be at a lower grade, but you're being called a director, um, which is to be honest, not very fair. Um, the other thing then is when you then try to get another job um, with it maybe within the federal system and you go up and say, hey, I'm a, I'm a director, they're like, yeah, but you're a grade 12, so sorry, you don't qualify for this grade 14 position. Too big of a jump. Um, the other thing it does is um, when you go out to the rest of the world um, and you say, you know, your salary, they start to say, hey, what's wrong here, right? There's something weird that this is your, what you say your salary is, but this is what your title is. So we're trying to standardize um, some of the titles as much as possible, and at the same time, make career paths. If you come in as an assistant, you should have a path all the way up, so one day you can aspire to be the director. You don't have to leave the Smithsonian or your museum in order to find that pathway through. Does that solve the pay inequity Sadly, no, um, but there is something that we really are keeping an eye on um, and working very closely um, with uh, uh, our OHR here, Office of Human Resources, to really ask them to help us um, and to try to see if we can do things like standardized PDs across the Smithsonian so there's not disparities there, um, as well as um, making sure that there's some pay equity built in. Um, but we haven't gotten there yet. Um, and I, I don't know what it's going to take, everybody. I mean, when we're 95% of the field, because um, the whole museum field is at about 70% female. 
Um, so we should be leading the way, um, but we're not. Um, and I definitely recognize that. Thank you. And if you can come up with an idea, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anything else, real quick? Okay, if not, you've been a fabulous um, audience. Thank you. That's my gratitude Thank coming you. through. <laughs> And most importantly, keep doing the fabulous work that you're doing. Um, I, I was just saying that there, uh, we just had a conversation recently in my team about how organized, um, I've done recently this talk and then also a talk with ARCS um, and my, um, my assistant who's recently in from, she came over to the Smithsonian from the DOD, she basically said, wow, these people are really organized. I was like, yeah, she's like, you know, you should pretty, pretty much put them in charge of the Smithsonian. <laughs> I agree with you. Um, it would make the world run a lot more smoothly. <laughs> so everybody take care. Have a good night. Um, thank you so much.